Good afternoon. My name is Benga Odunton. I lecture in international commercial law in the Kent Law School. And I'm here today to talk to you about understanding the legal criteria for spatial delimitation between the airspace and outer space. This is a question that has troubled my mind for over a decade now, uh, and it has attracted a lot of comments and commentary in legal literature generally. It's a question based on the fact that we have two opposing theories and two opposing regimes uh, relating to the sovereignty and jurisdiction of states above their territory. We have the first position reflected in treaties, and that is the position that every state has complete and exclusive jurisdiction in its airspace. Complete and exclusive sovereignty and jurisdiction is what is given to every state by the Chicago Convention of 1944. And this is the principle which we are all still operating today in international law as well as international relations. Then we have the reality also that we have the common heritage of mankind principle governing the jurisdiction of states in outer space. Outer space is the zone where we have outer space activities more easily denoted by the use of satellites and satellite technology. Uh, the position of international law as reflected in several treaties including the Outer Space Treaty in 1967 and the Moon Treaty of 1979 is that all states have a right of equal access to outer space and they have a right of equal use and that indeed outer space is the common heritage of mankind. The question then is, where does the hair space end and where in legal terms does outer space begin? Because as we all know, any frontier in international relations that is not certain will lead to quarrels, will lead to all kinds of conflicts and controversies. Hence, there are many theories on how to solve this perennial problem, this perennial question that has been asked every year at the meetings of the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in the United Nations. I'll take the theories one after the other, introducing their strengths and their weaknesses. We have the theory that we are stuck with by practice, and that is no present need to address the problem, no present need to pick a demarcation point between airspace and outer space. Proponents of these theories believe that if we start addressing this question precipitously, a bit too soon, we will encourage maximum claims, we will encourage ridiculous claims, we don't have enough facts, scientific facts, to pick the best as of yet, and therefore we should do absolutely nothing. It is a theory that tends to be favoured by the developed powerful states of the world, and one might wonder why. One in a cynical mood might conclude that this is because the present situation where no demarcation point is picked is actually in favour of the space-faring states, those states that have the technology to go into space. They do not now have to worry about whether they are passing through anyone's territory on their ascent and descent because we don't have a definition of where airspace begins and where outer space ends. But that is no reason why we should remain with this theory. This theory and this position is simply unsatisfactory because we have two different regimes which are logically opposed to each other. You cannot give me exclusive right over something and no right over another set of conditions and places and geophysical positions and not tell me exactly where one ends and the other begins. Hence, the no present theory no present need theory should not be the one we can say resolves the problem. Then we have the theory of the criteria for space activities. Wherever space activities take place, therein should be 
the position where we say outer space is. Here we have a slide of astronauts, cosmonauts, tourists, depends what you call it, enjoying themselves in an aircraft which is performing a parabolic flight, simulating the conditions of outer space. It's not yet in outer space, but you can create the conditions of outer space. Should we say outer space has begun there? Or indeed, should we say outer space began or begins at the laboratory, our nearest laboratory in the University of Kent here, where we have a space department conducting space experimentation and space research. The functional approach, saying that wherever the functions of outer space begins is where outer space is, is not helpful at all. It does not answer the question. It merges together so many things that it becomes useless on that note. Hence, we can easily discard of this theory. Let's pick the next theory. The aerodynamic lift theory works on the basis that wherever there's air, sufficient air to create the reaction on a flying body, which is why we call it the airplane, because it needs the reaction of air for its lift and for its ability to maneuver. Therein should be where we say airspace extends up to. And wherever the air is no longer found, then outer space begins from that position. Highly appealing, sound scientific, Problem is, science itself cannot, not has not, cannot resolve the height at which hair will be found. Because the variabilities and the way hair moves around the earth is such that it doesn't obey any uniform position. Traces of hair has been found over 20,000 miles away from the earth. So therefore, although we may even have an airplane in such a condition, miraculously, we can't certainly say that that's a position for aircraft to obey. So this criteria, this theory is not helpful. 25 miles away from the earth, which is the generality of opinion of where air can be found, is not science that we can rely on because we find it sometimes less than that, sometimes we find air more than that. Let's move to another theory which is introduced by the developing states that are found around the equator of the earth, Brazil, Indonesia, Chile, uh, and a few others, Kenya, who came together in 1977 to declare sovereignty over the position where you find geostationary satellites, which is 30,000 miles away from the earth. The reason why they did so is that the way satellites are being used is that satellites hang on the equator and can move around with the Earth, needing just about three of such satellites to cover the entire Earth. So it's a very valuable resource, very valuable because once you have your satellites there, you have a right to operate it and you can go on staying there forever. Many of these states, at least as of 1977, didn't have a space program. So they feared that by the time they need to put their own satellites out there, the position would have been taken. And at any rate, why are things hanging over their territories uh, for the rest of time without their own uh, permission and without them having a say on it? So their declaration said that all objects hanging at the geostationary orbit should only stay there if they have the permission of the underlying state. And this was their summation, the summation of their own uh, resolution to the spatial demarcation problem. The problem with this view, as you would know, is that it is quite unpopular. Every other state that is not an equatorial state does not think it's a wise decision, it's not a wise position to put the demarcation point, simply because 30,000 miles away from the Earth is quite colossal in its uh, ambition of a state to extend its own jurisdiction. And the Bogota Declaration view, therefore, cannot be of help to us, or at least has not been accepted. We have the usk had infinitum theory, which says that outer space sovereignty 
jurisdiction should belong to all states in infinitum. You can as well conclude immediately that it is an usk ad absurdum, an absurd conclusion. It's absurd because you cannot have a situation where each state draws a cone into outer space as its own jurisdiction, simply because the earth is continuously moving. So now you have mass above you, now you've moved, and mass is no longer above you. So what do you really own? You own nothing. You own a piece of time in space. Then we move to the national security principle. The national security view is one which is based on the need for all states to protect themselves from the activities of other states, which may be illegal, which may be negligent, which may cause harm to the underlying state. And to that extent, some states be believe that the position where their own jurisdiction should end should be so high that there is no possibility of a security implication on them. It is quite clear that with the advancement of, te of technology, this position will keep shifting and keep shifting higher and higher until we end up with the usk had infinitum theory all over again, and absurd heights will be claimed. It's actually a dangerous proposition to adopt this principle, even though it looks like it's in the interest of poorer states or weaker states, because in essence, it reduces your security to as much power as you have, as much technological advancement as you have uh, to police uh, the security that you're supposed to have over your territory. So the security principle is not helpful. Can we have a look at another theory? The lowest point of orbital flight. The lowest point of orbital flight theory is based on the realization that space, space technology satellites are placed in space when they have no opportunity to be drawn again into the airspace and fall back to Earth. When they enter into orbit, when they are shot as rockets and they can stay orbiting the Earth on a particular, at a particular speed uh, continuously, that that surely should be the point where outer space uh, begins. The problem with this view, the problem with this view again is that just like the airspace, it can be variable, the position where things fall back to Earth or stay in orbit. Uh, and therefore, it's not as scientific as it does appear. Secondly, the position may actually be so high that we start asking what type of satellites are we talking about? Are we talking about low Earth orbit satellites? Are we talking about the geostationary sat satellites that are up to 30,000 miles? I think, despite its attraction, despite its popularity among scientists, this theory is not the resolution to the spatial demarcation problem. Hence, we can have a look at the theory of arbitrary distances. The theory of arbitrary distances simply adopts the proposition that we can arbitrarily decide where airspace ends and where outer space begins. And suggestions have ranged between the tallest building, a few meters above the tallest building in cities, to 30,000 miles, 1,500,000 miles away from the Earth. Why not? It just belongs to the imagination of the person thinking of the solution. The theory of arbitrary distances, as much as it looks ridiculous, is the basis upon which we have formed our own conclusions which we will have a look at uh, shortly. We need to develop a conclusive resolution of the spatial demarcation problem in international law. We do need to develop this conclusion because any frontier that is not specific is going to be a source of dispute. It's going to be a source of tension. Uh, we have not left the boundaries of our states undefined. We have boundary markers between countries. We have also resolved the territorial sea, the exclusive economic zone, the contiguous zone in the law of the sea. Why are we leaving the spatial consideration left unaddressed? Hence, 
in summation, I want to introduce this solution. And it is based on arbitrary distances, but arbitrary distances resting on considerations of logic and considerations of equity on considerations of science. I believe that outer space should begin at 100 miles above the Earth. I believe that airspace should end at 55 miles above the Earth in legal terms. I believe that the 45 miles in between these two positions should be a buffer zone, a zone much along the lines of the contiguous zone in the law of the sea, a zone that is used for policing, security, sanitary purposes to protect the underlying state. Hence, although airspace ends at 55 miles, if a vehicle, a space vehicle, an air vehicle hangs at 57 miles, the underlying state should be able to inquire as to what it is doing there and perhaps insist that it should be moved from there. But 25 miles above the hearth is the generality of opinion where air ends and aircraft can operate. Let's add to that 30 miles, just to be sure. We have 55 miles. And 70 to 90 miles is where we have roughly concluded that things stay in orbit, where the uh, satellites or any objects can stay in orbit. Why not add to that another 10 miles, just to assuage the security feelings of some in the underlying states, and then we can say that we have a generous portion of territory added to the scientific theories as to where airspace and outer space should begin, and that should re be our resolution points on the spatial demarcation problem. I make bold to say that this will not resolve the controversy. This will not resolve it entirely. Indeed, a specific treaty will have to be entered into by states. A specific treaty will have to be sponsored by the United Nations eventually to resolve this point. And I dare say that that's going to happen quite soon. I hope that my thinking in this area would have contributed to the eventual resolution that will be adopted by states in the future. Thank you for listening.